Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Piotr Holubovic. I work in Photos SRE at Google. And it's actually my first DevOps days ever, so I'm super excited. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm going to share a story about uh, one time we worked on an SLO in Photos. And I hope uh, you'll find some things uh, interesting in there. So um, when people think of SLO, I think it, they think mostly of like a target that's attached, attached to a key metric of their service, something like error rate and availability and uh, latency. And then you might also think of uh, error budgets and SLO-based alerting and, and so on. But what we found out, it's sometimes uh, figuring out what exactly the SLO should be based on and what it should or shouldn't include is a challenge in itself. So uh, I'll try to illustrate that today. So here's the agenda for the, uh, the presentation. So I'll give a, f a, a few uh, words of a background of like how it all started. And the main part is the process of how we uh, approached uh, the SLO and how we try to define it. Uh, I'll say a few words also about uh, how we picked the particular targets for the SLO. And I'll try to leave a few minutes at the end for uh, questions. So let's get to it. So the service I'm going to talk about is called Fife. That stands for Flexible Image Frontend. And it's one of the older services we have in Photos. It's an image serving service that used to power Picasa. And now it powers uh, Google Photos or, or Gmail, but also a bunch of other uh, products across Google. So it's pretty fa fairly used. And uh, our team, Photos of Series, supports that. So back in 2018, uh, our team was tasked with uh, migrating the monitoring and alerting of uh, that service from one framework to another. And we started thinking, you know, do we actually have to migrate everything? Maybe some of the consoles or some of the alerts are not really that useful anymore. And uh, we had a hard time figuring, figuring that out because we really had no notion of like which metric is the most critical for the service. And we realized the service had no SLO, so maybe this was a good opportunity to kind of think of, you know, what are the key metrics uh, for the service. So we, we did that. We, we took that opportunity, and uh, we started thinking of how we would design uh, an SLO for it. So here's basically the API for the service. Um, it's, it's fairly, fairly simple. Uh, this, the service receives a URL uh, to, of some image, does some processing, and uh, returns the actual image. You know, it's like an HTTP service. So we thought, you know, naively, it's not that difficult. We could just take all those requests together, measure the error rate, put some target on that, measure latency, couple targets here, and we're done. But then as we, um, as we looked into that, we realized that um, there had been a few attempts to set up an SLO for the service. You know, it's been around for, for a while, and none of them actually succeeded. So it wasn't uh, that, that easy, as easy as we thought. Um, so we looked into what were the challenges uh, before us. So, um, first of all, I mentioned the service was used by many uh, products within Google. So typically, when you set up an SLO, you, know, you kind of start from the user and see what their expectations are, uh, how critical these are. It's kind of hard if your service is directly used by, by over 100 different, uh, different products. And also, because the service had been used for, for many years, uh, our customers had what we call implicit SLO. So they just kind of assumed the service is going to perform as it performs typically on a good day. So uh, we wanted to kind of uh, honor that and uh, have an official SLO that wouldn't be too far from what the customers uh, were, were already expecting. Then there's a the question of prioritization. Obviously, you have products that have a much different user base, like comparing Google Photos or, or Gmail to a bunch of much smaller uh, projects at Google. So should we somehow prioritize the, the biggest uh, uh, customer in the SLO? And finally, we didn't, we're not sure how we should communicate that process. Should we actually have like a back and forth with the teams, or we should just uh, come up with something and uh, propose it to everybody? So uh, let's get into uh, how, we, how we approach that. So the first thing is um, we wanted to make this problem a bit simpler, kind of reduce the, the space. And what we started thinking is that maybe if the requests that come to our service are similar, and they produce similar responses, and they have similar performance, then we really don't need, to, uh, don't need to care which product they're part of. They're kind of you know, a similar bucket, similar kind of traffic uh, that we receive. And if we can do that, um, then we can just focus on the types of requests and types of responses we produce, as opposed to uh, which particular product this image is part of. Um, so that means we need to take a look at what kind of traffic the service receives. 
And even though the API is simple, there's actually, there's actually a bunch of parameters. So some of them the customers would choose when they first integrate with the service, and some uh, they would select kind of uh, on the fly. So our service would support six different metadata backends, so like places where you store the image metadata, and three stores for the actual bytes. There were two interfaces to connect to the service. The service itself had two stacks for the user-generated and machine-generated traffic. And there's a bunch of options you can append to a URL uh, to kind of have processing on the fly. Uh, and finally, your request might be searched from cache as well. So we looked into uh, how these affect uh, the performance. And with all that, with all those um, parameters out there, what we really wanted to have is, let's say, no more than 10 different categories kind of, of, of traffic. And that's because we try to use SLO as a decision-making uh, tool, and it's hard to do it when you have like 100 or 1,000 numbers. Um, and then we realized that it actually is pretty similar to this magic number of 7 plus minus 2, which is uh, the number of objects that an average human can uh, hold in working memory. Um, and I guess it kind of makes sense. We try to have an SLO be simple so you can kind of get your head around it. OK, cool. So let's look at, uh, let's start with the backends. So I mentioned there's six metadata and three uh, image byte uh, backends. So the metadata backends, they're usually built by like the biggest customers. They kind of serve their use case, and then when smaller customers come in, they kind of usually choose one of them, depending on which uh, is most suitable. Um, so fortunately, each metadata backend only really connects to one byte store. So that, makes, that means there's not that many uh, combinations out there. And um, even better, one of the metadata backends is known to be best effort. So like, we actually didn't want to include it in a specific SLO. There was no way we could promise any particular uh, performance of it. So that leaves us with, uh, with five initial kind of types of traffic. And it's, it's a pretty good start, because as I mentioned, the metadata backends, they kind of have different capabilities. You can uh, have different metadata of the image. So in a way, they describe the kind of traffic, the kind of images you might want to serve uh, pretty well. All right, so looking at the other dimensions that I mentioned, uh, we realized that some of them are not as important as others. So for example, the first one would be the, the kind of interface you connect to. You know, that's visible, but it's only really a thin wrapper on top of a service. So we decided we were totally fine with just putting all those requests together and measuring their performance collectively. So this, uh, this one can go away. Then there are two stacks of a service. So the batch stack is essentially where all the map producers and pipeline uh, kind of make requests. So it tends to get overloaded every now and then. And the, uh, the performance is not as good as the user-facing stack. So we call it best effort. And we thought, you know, we could have uh, some specific SLO that's just lower than, uh, than the user-facing one. But at the same time, it's not really high priority. Best effort is usually good enough, and everybody like within Google kind of understands what that means. So it's, it's OK if we just focus on the user-facing uh, stack and the user-facing requests, which are more critical. When it comes to processing options, these would be things like requesting an image in a specific format, or request cropping, or some color transformation and, and, and stuff. So this is a little hard, because um, there's many different options you can request. And so it's, it's kind of hard to um, put them into buckets. I kind of try to uh, quantify them into like, uh, just a few categories. And also, we felt like this um, is spread evenly across many use cases. It's not really distinctive of any specific use case. So um, it will be hard and not as critical. So we decided to drop this one as well. Caching is where it really became tricky, because caching obviously uh, affects uh, latency. Uh, it affects performance latency in particular. Uh, that's what the cache is, is, is for. Is for. Uh, it also might affect availability, because just fewer things can go wrong if you serve from cache. And at the same time, the level of, ca of uh, cache usage varies greatly uh, between uh, customers. Some products, they really value freshness, so they would have like a 0% cache usage, whereas other customers would have over 90% of their traffic searched from cache. So we felt like we definitely need to include that in our SLO. Um, the question is how. So we, we considered a few options how we could do that. And the first one is fairly simple. We could just ignore uh, the existence of cache in our SLO. We could just say we, it's an internal detail. You know, we should prepare for the worst. We should not assume the existence of cache. Um, you know, uh, just, just, just don't include there. Um, and it's not unreasonable. There are services at Google that do that. Um, but when we proposed this to the developer team, 
they really opposed it because, as I mentioned, there are some customers that use the traffic over 90% of their of time. So if we made an SLO that does not include that, it would be an order of magnitude worse, and it means it's either useless for them or they would get really angry. And we didn't really want to make it the performance that much worse. So we tried to, dis to, to come up with something different. So the other option we came with was to categorize the customers, kind of put them into different tiers depending on how we expect them, how much we expect them to use the cache. Um, and then we could make like different levels of performance guarantees based on that. That's also a little tricky to implement because you can kind of have to think how many tiers you want and how do you put the customers in it. Um, they have, do they have to like monitor their cache hit rate to, to know which, which bucket they're in? Um, so maybe there's something else as well. And the third option we came with was to be transparent about it. So essentially to say, you know, your request may hit the cache or may be served on the back end. Here's the performance you'll get when it, hits, when it hits cache. Here's the performance otherwise. And we thought it's pretty fair. But first of all, someone noticed that we could actually drop the entire cache and we would still be within SLO because we make no promises. So it's really just uh, comes down to the same as the first one. And also the customers would have to then really track how much they're using the cache kind of themselves in order to, to estimate what latency they can expect from our service. So it sounded like we should go for the, for the second option. And uh, so we assumed it mostly impacts latency. So then the number of kind of tiers that you want to put the customers in depends on what latency targets uh, you, you have in your SLO. We wanted to have a 90th percentile latency target and 99th percentile latency. And no customer uses the cache more than 99% of time. So it really just comes down to whether the customer uses the, 90, the, the cache more than 90%, in which case, sure, they'll get good SLO, good performance uh, guarantee, or they use the cache less than 90% of time. So the 90th percentile is, you know, latency is not as good. And when we uh, analyzed that, we actually realized that uh, the level of cache usage uh, depends greatly on which metadata backend the customers would use, uh, which kind of, you know, makes sense. Some metadata backends, they're really suited probably for repetitive traffic or maybe um, traffic that lends itself easy to, uh, to caching. So we could kind of group those uh, metadata backends into two of them that almost all the time would produce a very high uh, cache hit rate uh, and the rest. So then it is a generalization. You know, it is possible that someone would use one uh, backend but actually would, have, would not have as good um, uh, cache hit rate. But we figured that like, for the vast, vast majority of customers, uh, that this would work, so we could just go with that. Cool. In hindsight, we also realized there was a fourth option, which we didn't consider initially, which was to try and guarantee the cache, uh, cache usage. So that means we could theoretically come up with like a list of requirements and tell the customers, if you meet those requirements, you'll be using cache a lot, hence you'll get uh, you know, better performance. But it's, it's more tricky, actually, because some of the cache is just a Google-wide infrastructure, which we don't really control, and we don't really know exactly uh, you know, what those requirements are. Um, and then some of these are just hard to, to phrase, as in like, you know, how popular is your most common request or something. Um, so that's probably why we didn't uh, think about it initially. So that uh, exhausts the list of dimensions uh, that we came up with, or does it? There's actually one more that it's not, it's not as explicit. But remember, we're talking about an image serving service. So we have to take into consideration the size of the image, which may not be uh, you know, stated in the request, but clearly the bigger the image that we're serving, we can expect higher latency, and maybe there's also an availability impact as well. So we, we looked into that, how that would uh, go into our SLO. So this is, again, like a continuous kind of dimension, which is a little hard to, uh, to put into, into buckets. The most typical approach we, we do for such dimensions like, like latency is to can have a kind of formula that would express what your target latency is in relation to, to the, in this case, the image size. So if you, if you manage to come with a, with a linear formula that would look something like this, um, and that's, that's not bad. It actually is used pretty frequently for SLO that's mostly for yourself. Like you want to make sure that uh, your service is performing according to your expectations. We felt though it's a little harder if it's something that we want to share with a lot of customers within Google. Uh, because remember, we're coming from a point where there was no SLO at all for years. 
And if we come with like an equation or something, then they'll, they'll have to do the math themselves and track the distribution of sizes for their traffic and so on. So you know, maybe that's not uh, what we were looking for. So then the other option would be we could try again, kind of put it into discrete buckets uh, by image size. So something like small, medium, and large image, and then have different SLO uh, for each of those. But what we found out when we looked into that is that um, the vast, vast majority of our traffic is really the small images, which is uh, some use cases only serve small images, and others, even if they have like full resolution, high, you know, high quality images, uh, it's much more common that we would actually show like a thumbnail or like a small version in the application. Um, so what that meant is that if we put in kind of equal size buckets for it, the medium and large one would represent a very small portion of our traffic, which we didn't feel like it's really that uh, meaningful to us. Um, or if we change the sizes of the buckets, then the large bucket would really encompass such a wide binder, boundary that any target that we would give there um, would not be really um, you know, meaningful either. And on top of it all, we realized that there was a class of errors where the request would, would end with an error without us even knowing what the image size was, because we didn't manage to get it. So then it's kind of hard to classify you know, which, uh, which bucket this error belongs to. So we, you know, we thought, like, do we actually need it? Can't we just rely uh, well, on like, the, the tail end uh, of our measurement? Um, and we figured, you know, we could just measure the 99th percentile. This most likely will uh, account for the, the last 1% uh, you know, of, of our uh, latency. And if we feel like we are missing something, we can always measure the, the last 99.9% you know, out um, and hopefully capture all the outliers uh, out there. So yeah, just keep it simple. All right, so um, overall, um, what we ended up with is five buckets uh, where each of, uh, where it, they belong to two different tiers depending on our expected cache hit rate. Um, and then, so we, we, we started looking for the targets, with the availability and the two latency targets. And, you know, tip one way of approaching that, which we kind of considered initially, is you can start with a user, kind of make uh, some, some research about what the user would expect in a given use case. Uh, but fortunately, in this case, we had the implicit SLO. So we kind of had all those customers for mostly for years, but they did not complain. So we could just assume that if we keep giving the same performance, it's good enough. You know, maybe we could be giving worse performance, they still wouldn't complain. But that's something to start with. So we measured the, the, the performance in each of those buckets for um, availability and, and latency. And then we kind of added some margin. And what we realized is that within each uh, tier, the performance was similar. You know, backends are different, so it wasn't identical. Um, but they were similar enough that if we do some you know, rounding up or, or picking the maximum, what we ended up with is just a single number um, for each of the uh, targets, for each of the tiers. Now, it's important to, to note that we would still measure them separately because, after all, they represent different use cases. Their QPS might be much different. Um, but in terms of like, how it's presented uh, to the customers and how we think about it, I think it's, uh, it, it gets as simple as it can get. All right, so uh, it took us... It took us around two months um, to get the, the, the SLO defined and uh, you know, have everybody sign off from the SRE, the product, and, and, the, and the dev teams. And once we did that, um, we implemented the SLO monitoring, uh, and we made sure to backfill um, historical data on both bad and, and good days to kind of make sure it accurately represents uh, the, the outages we knew about. And when we were happy with that, we announced the SLO, we, uh, we shared with our customers and welcomed uh, any feedback. After we did that, no, we still spent a few months uh, implementing SLO-based alerting. Um, so we did that. It was one of our first cases where we would use SLO-based alerting, and we really wanted to make sure that kind of the coverage is, is, is OK and we're not going to miss anything by having simpler alerts. Um, and it was actually pretty good. We were pretty happy about it. Um, we, we have fewer alerts overall, and uh, the level of, uh, of noise was much lower, and the coverage was still good. So uh, we switched. We managed to delete some of the older alerts. And sometime later, we also complemented that with what we call a black box SLO, which would be an SLO that's measured higher in the stack. It doesn't have that uh, bucketing that, that this one has, 
but it will measure uh, any impact of an outage that might happen before the requests actually reach our service, so somewhere along the way, just to make sure we, we accurately capture any potential uh, user visible uh, impact of an outage. So a few words about how we've used the SLO since that time. So uh, the first case is, uh, is for monitoring, right? So uh, this is like SLO gives us like a bigger picture of how the service is performing. So it's fairly common that you would have a couple outages, you know, in a month. But then the question is, is it the, the service still performing according to our expectations? Do we need to take some action or is it still under control? So this kind of like monthly overview of our SLO performance uh, gives us that. Um, and you can also, at, at the error burn down kind of chart, you can kind of tell what's the source of errors. So is it just, you know, a low constant error rate that just eats your budget all the way and you're out? Or is it just a couple of big outages that really impacted the service? So that's pretty cool. Um, and also when the big outages happen, and they do happen, SLO is the, the best way to tell us what the user impact was. So how many errors we served, uh, and you can kind of put it in, in context as to what your expectation was and, um, yeah. The other thing, um, we also use it for alerting. And I'd say the greatest thing about using SLO for alerting is that it really gives you like a, a baseline, like a written um, point of reference as to what, uh, what alert is useful. Um, so previously, you know, you'd have an alert and then, uh, the person receiving it could say, you know, I don't think it's really that important. Maybe I should tweak it. Maybe I should silence it or change the threshold. And since we have an SLO, whenever this conversation happens, uh, it means you need to change the SLO, which is, you know, a bigger thing. We need to actually take a step back and, re, you know, re-evaluate re uh, of what is important to our users. Um, and otherwise, if the alert happens, that means there is user visible impact, and we, we need to take action. Um, and also, as kind of another bonus of this is that SLO-based alerting gives you like those alerts if you don't have any particular outage, it's just that your constant error rate is just a bit, a bit higher than what you would expect. Um, so um, we get, we get uh, alerts for that kind of situation as well. All right, so um, overall, I think like, the, biggest, um, the biggest challenge here when doing this, uh, this kind of project is figuring out which, um, which dimensions, which criteria to include and not to include uh, in the SLO. And uh, we obviously had a lot of discussions about it. Like some attempts, uh, you know, some previous attempts would uh, try to include the biggest customers specifically in the SLO, which didn't really scale well. So there was some discussion about do we really want to drop it. Uh, we didn't include the size uh, of the image, so uh, we debated that a lot as well. Uh, but I think overall what we reached is a really uh, pretty good solution. Um, so as I mentioned, we have simple monitoring, something that clearly shows you if your service is performing according to the expectations. We have fewer alerts than we used to have, but the ones we do have actually have a better signal-to-noise ratio, um, so, so that's pretty cool uh, for our team. And we have finally an explicit uh, SLO, something that both the current and the potential new customers can refer to when they want to know what performance they can expect from our service. So I think overall, you know, this worked very for worked well from, uh, for everybody who was involved with the service. And that was my last slide. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. And you can also leave feedback at the, this link. Thank you. Do we have any questions? hard for us to see, really wave the hands. <laughs> you can also find me in the, around at, at the conference, so feel free to come and chat. Right. Cool. I think there's one question. Oh, we did have one. What's the constant error rate from? Okay, so essentially there is um, certain kind of traffic that is more problematic than other. Um, in certain, um, how to say it? Um, yeah, I don't know how to how to describe it, but essentially th there might be cases where um, the very small portion of the traffic essentially is uh, is more problematic from our backends. Um, it's uh, kind of the low 
the, the long tail of uh, a rare use case, let's say. Um, and, you know, we try to, uh, you know, fix bugs as we see them, but if we decide that it's just um, not worth it, you know, that it's just uh, low enough compared to our expectations, we're okay with that, you know. Um, we won't always go and um, figure out every possible uh, path uh, that the request might take that might end in error. So that does bite us sometimes, to be honest. And we do every now and then, for example, do probers, which would uh, test a specific type of request that's not uh, commonly used. For example, w one example was, um, you know, we also support raw images, right, like from a camera. That's a very, very small portion of our traffic. But, um, you know, if, if they break, it, it's not good, right? So we try and detect a, any specific scenario where uh, a user might be, like, very impacted. But overall, if it's just um, a very rare uh, flow that people occasionally fall into, um, then we're okay with that. And uh, the same actually applies probably to our dependencies. You know, we depend on a lot of services within Google uh, for storing, you know, metadata and, and by stores. They might also just have, like, this low error rate from, um, I guess, bugs or maybe um, some rarely uh, followed paths. And, you know, as long as they're within their SLOs and we were within ours, then we're okay with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.